it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chad Lichardello. This week, the death of soldier and statesman Colin Powell. We will talk to one of his closest friends and advisors. We're also going to preview next week's extradition case against Julian Assange with the Ezra in Chief of WikiLeaks. But first. The coronavirus pandemic has triggered an unprecedented disruption of global supply chains as unexpected spikes in demand, changes in economic behaviour and bottlenecks from shutdowns all take their toll. It's a crisis of global proportions, from major bottlenecks at busy ports to a lack of computer chips for auto manufacturers and even a shortage of truck drivers to deliver all those goods. As a result, American consumers are finding empty shelves in supermarkets and the holiday season could be one of disappointments for those waiting on parcels to arrive, be they from across town or across the world. Last week, President Biden ordered ports to keep working around the clock and for private companies to step up their delivery efforts too. FedEx and UPS are the shippers for some of our nation's largest stores. Their commitment to go all in on 24-7 operations means that businesses of all sizes will get their goods on shelves faster and more reliably. But there are log jams all through the supply chain now, from exporters like China running short on shipping containers to container ships languishing off major ports in places like Los Angeles, waiting days and days to be unloaded, to a shortage of dock workers, truck drivers and shelf stackers. And then there are the production delays, as factories that turned to the production of PPE and other COVID-related goods are now retooling and recalibrating to reopening economies. It is a real, real mess, Chaz. And if Joe Biden can't get his arms around this in double quick time, he's going to be about as popular this Christmas as the Grinch, I reckon. I think you're right about that. There have been 50 to 60 ships anchored outside Los Angeles and Long Beach ports for the last month now. That's a lot of ships. If you stretched out the potential payloads on those ships, the cargo boxes would stretch halfway across the country. And it's also a bad place for those ships to be stuck at, because those ports are responsible for about 40% of the containers brought into America. So there's your supply crunch right there. Okay, why not skip the ports entirely? Just use cargo planes instead. No dice. The world's biggest ever cargo plane would need to make about 397 journeys, not including reloading trips, just to ship what that cargo boat that got stuck in the Suez Canal could move in one trip if it's not stuck in the Suez Canal. So there aren't a lot of easy answers. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg can see the bright side, though. Look, uh, part of what's happening isn't just the supply side, it's the demand side. Demand is off the charts. Retail sales are through the roof. And if you think about those images of uh, ships, for example, waiting at anchor on the West Coast, you know, every one of those ships uh, is full of record amounts of goods that Americans are buying uh, because demand is up, because income is up, uh, because the president has successfully guided this economy out of the teeth of a terrifying recession. Bravo. Some heroic spin right there. Look, he's right that retail spending is up. That line you see there, that's retail spending adjusted for inflation. So look, it's up. But there is a lot more to the problem than that. And to be fair, Biden knows that as well. That's why he declared a 90-day sprint to clear a path for cargo, including him leaning on the LA ports to open up 24-7, as John described. But it's more complicated than that as well, because the port might be public property. He can push them around. But the port of Los Angeles has 21 different terminals, each of which is run by a different terminal operating company. Then there are the trucking companies and railroads that move goods from the port to the warehouses. They're suffering serious labour shortages. Then there are the tugboat operators, customs officials, freight forwarders, the Coast Guard. So many different groups of people, many of whom are privately controlled. And if they don't all coordinate perfectly, the productivity gains from 24-7 operations could easily be frittered away. I tell you how you know for sure that the pitch is complicated. It's because long before the vaccines or the demand spike, any of this, back in 2020, 
America had not one port ranked in the world's top 50 ports for getting ships in and getting ships out. The highest ranked American port was Philadelphia on number 83. LA port ranks number 328 in the world and Long Beach ranks number 333. So how do you fix those kinds of ports? Well, pushing them to go 24-7, Great start. That's what happens with Asian ports. They work 168 hours a week, whereas in America, ships are generally worked 112 hours per week with terminal gates only operating 88 hours a week. And in LA and Long Beach ports, customs officers, which are required to clear and admit goods into America, are only open Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. till 4.30 p.m. They might want to fix that. The other point that some are making is that there's precious little automation going on in American ports, unlike other ports, because the Longshoremen's Union Agreement keeps automation out of terminals till at least 2025. Lots to take in there, John. Should we get some help? Please, let's get some <laughs> help. Joining us with more is Scott Linsicum. He's from the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. He's an international trade expert and free trade advocate. Scott, welcome to Planet America. Thanks for having me. So we've been hearing a lot about this supply chain crisis locally in the United States and globally, but there on the shelves of stores in the United States. What are the telltale signs this is happening? The number one sign is that store shelves are a little emptier than we're used to. Um, you know, certainly we're not thinking um, communist Russia or anything like that. But, uh, you know, the abundance that Americans have come to expect pre-pandemic uh, and that we expected upon reopening the economy just really aren't there. And so there are going to be occasional shortages of certain goods and occasional things that you just can't get. Uh, especially as we're leading into Christmas season. Now, Scott, the administration has promised a 90-day sprint to clear the backup. How long, realistically, do you think it's going to take before trade gets back to normal? It's going to last uh, longer than 90 days, unfortunately. Um, and look, you know, the, the president's efforts are commendable. They are trying to uh, work the levers they have. But the reality is that a lot of the issues at the ports um, reflect a system that has been developed over decades, a system reflecting all sorts of labor and trade and immigration and other policies um, that just can't be fixed overnight. And so while you might be able to get to the ports to stay open a little longer and you might be able to ease some backlogs here and there, uh, you're not going to uh, be able to build new warehouses. You're not going to be able to recruit a ton new, of new truckers. Uh, you're not going to be able to uh, have larger ports in place. Um, and those types of systemic issues have really dragged down U.S. port and logistics efficiency over the years. And now they're unfortunately rearing their head. OK, Scott, but your trucks and ports and so on, that's all kind of at the end of the supply chain. What about winding it back to the start? What are the things that are going wrong, particularly those that are directly COVID-related? A lot of it is just the pandemic doing the pandemic things. Um, you know, you have supply and demand imbalances across the world as countries are closing and then reopening or closing and reopening again. Um, you also have factory closures or port closures um, and uh, workers that uh, have been on the sidelines and are just getting back to it. Um, those types of things are going to affect all links in the supply chain, especially on the front end in Asia, as those economies uh, are more closed and not as vaccinated uh, as uh, other Western economies. Uh, the other issue you're going to have is uh, changing consumer patterns. You're going to, you know, Americans, for example, have become much more accustomed to shopping for furniture and other big ticket items over the internet. And that's going to put additional pressure on, on logistics and supply chain. You also have a logistics manager moving more from a just-in-time inventory system to a just-in-case inventory system, that they want to stockpile more inventories than they used to do just in case there's another pandemic-related outage of some sort. And that, again, is going to build on the uh, pressure on the supply chain that was used to a, a slower and more predictable and consistent uh, import volumes. Scott, the administration says that at least part of the ship congestion is because demand is through the roof and that at least is a good thing. Is that a fair point? Some of it is a good thing. And so it's a partially good point. Uh, the fact is that as vaccinations proliferated here in the United States and as uh, state and local economies reopened, uh, consumers got out there and spent. And that is a, a good thing. We want uh, to resume our normal lives. 
What's unmentioned, however, is that there's also a lot of U.S. Uh, government stimulus spending. So these are uh, pandemic-related stimulus checks, unemployment benefits, and other types of federal spending that have even goosed consumer demand even more. And so, you know, I, I equate it to putting a fire hose up to a pinhole because supply, of course, remains constricted for all the practical reasons we've discussed. When you turn that hose on, you're inevitably going to get some, some messy blowback. Scott Linsicum, good to have you with us on Planet America. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. There was some good news this week for the Biden administration's plans to roll out a COVID booster program with the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, authorising boosters from Johnson & Johnson and Moderna. And, importantly, it is allowing the mixing and matching of these half-dose boosters, making the rollout to providers like pharmacies that much easier and easier for consumers too. You won't have to shop around to find the same brand as your first couple of shots. It is crucial timing as well as the weather continues to cool. There are concerns infections are spiking again in some places, Chad. Yeah, especially in the north, uh, as people head inside for the winter. John, mm. This map here shows the COVID case hotspots over the last week. They're the darker zones, the hotspots. As you can see, they're mostly in the more unvaccinated regions of the north. So stay tuned there. Not that numbers for cases, hospitalizations or deaths have changed all that much nationally. The locations might change, but the overall numbers, at least so far, are not. In the meantime, the number one cause of death for people aged 35 to 54 in September continues to be COVID. An eighth of Americans say that one of their family has died from COVID. Another fifth say a close friend has died from COVID. Do the math and that means a third of Americans have now lost someone close to COVID. About 110 million Americans seriously affected by those 710,000 deaths. The one bit of good news though this week in vaccines is that according to the latest Kaiser survey, black people have finally closed the gap on vaccines with 70 to 73 percent of adults having been vaccinated at least once, regardless of race. Now that is good news. The bad news is that America overall has now slipped to number 49 in the world for the share of their total population that is fully vaccinated, having just been passed by Australia at number 45. Let me emphasize just how bad a showing that is for America. This is the rate at which Americans have gotten fully vaccinated. This is the rate at which Australians have gotten fully vaccinated. Back when we were four and a half percent fully vaccinated, they were 45% fully vaccinated. And now we've passed them and we're barely slowing down. That takes us to our vaccine tables for if American and Australian states were combined. These are the shares of the total population which have had at least one shot. And this week, I've added the ACT by popular request. Trust them to watch ABC News. And because they're doing so well. So that makes 57 states in total with ACT at number three and New South Wales at number nine, Victoria at number 15, and all states within the top 40 of 57 states. As for the percentage of the total population that is fully vaccinated, ACT is number six, New South Wales is number seven, Tasmania is number 24, Victoria is number 25, and then the rest are at the bottom of the top 50 of 57. John. Chaz, now to the death of an American hero, General Colin Powell, who died this week from complications associated with COVID-19 at the age of 84. Powell was fully vaccinated, but he was suffering from a form of blood cancer and Parkinson's disease, making him particularly vulnerable, Chaz. Yeah, a recent study found that people with Parkinson's had a COVID mortality rate of 36%. Another study found that 55% of multiple myeloma patients, which is what Colin Powell had, failed to fully respond to COVID vaccines. So Powell was really up against it. Indeed he was. Former President George W. Bush, who appointed Powell Secretary of State in 2001, described him as a, quote, great public servant, family man and friend. President Barack Obama said that Colin Powell understood what was best in this country, yet never denied the role race played in his own life and in our society. And President Donald Trump said that Powell was a classic rhino, if even that, always being the first to attack other Republicans. He made plenty of mistakes, but anyway, may he rest in peace. President Biden announced the American flag would fly at half-mast at the White House and all public buildings this week to honour Colin Powell.
the 65th Secretary of State. Colin Powell was revered as a four-star general, national security advisor, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and America's first black Secretary of State. And Powell was reviled as the face of the Bush administration's push for war in Iraq. Have we found a factory or a, a plant or a uh, warehouse full of chemical rounds? No, not yet. Finally, Powell was redeemed in the eyes of some for putting party aside to support Barack Obama and later oppose Donald Trump. Joe Biden will be a president we will all be proud to salute. With Joe Biden in the White House, you will never doubt that he will stand with our friends and stand up to our adversaries, never the other way around. Born in the South Bronx of New York, the son of Jamaican immigrant parents, Colin Powell was appointed National Security Advisor in the final two years of the Reagan administration. And he helped negotiate the end of the Cold War with Soviet Russia. We see stirrings in East Germany, <laughs> cries for freedom in the Baltic, and rumblings in the Ukraine. Most Americans, though, got to know Colin Powell during the US-led invasion to oust Iraqi forces from Kuwait in 1991. Colin Powell has had a truly distinguished military career, and he's a complete soldier. The success of Operation Desert Storm helped to erase the bitter memories of the Vietnam War two decades earlier. Colin Powell had also served there with distinction. When Powell retired from the military after 35 years, he was urged to run to become America's Commander-in-Chief, the first African-American president. A grassroots draft General Powell movement was formed. Big donors opened their checkbooks. Polls in the first primary state, New Hampshire, put Colin Powell at the front of the field of Republican rivals to Bill Clinton with 34% of the vote. Good afternoon. In November 1995, though, Colin Powell made this announcement. I will not be a candidate for president or for any other elective office in 1996. I know that this is the right decision for me. It was not reached easily or without a great deal of personal anguish. He didn't close the door on politics entirely and Powell signaled that he wanted to continue to serve in some capacity. I have a deep love for this country that has no bounds. I will find other ways to contribute to the important work needed to keep us moving forward. He later admitted his wife Alma's fears about him being assassinated weighed heavily against running for the White House. Exit polls on the day Bill Clinton beat Republican Bob Dole showed Colin Powell would have won the presidency in a landslide with 50% of the vote to Clinton's 38 and independent Ross Perot on nine. It was five years later with the election of President George W. Bush that Colin Powell was appointed America's top diplomat. Lending gravitas to the younger Bush, which became crucial building international coalitions in the aftermath of 9-11. A terrible, terrible tragedy has befallen my nation, but it has befallen all the nations of this region, all the nations of the world, and befallen all those who believe in democracy. The Powell doctrine of using military force only as a last resort and only then with overwhelming force was evident in the successful operation to remove the Taliban from Afghanistan. but. Colin Powell remained sceptical of the case for war in Iraq and was misled about the strength of the intelligence claiming Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction. Ironically, that scepticism is what made him the administration's most powerful public advocate. Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. The Bush team, led by Defence Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and Vice President Dick Cheney, himself a former Defence Secretary, ignored the Powell Doctrine in executing Operation Iraqi Freedom. They also ignored what Powell himself called the Pottery Barn Rule of, if you break it, you own it. America's failure to adequately prepare for the aftermath of Saddam's removal cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Increasingly at odds with the president, Powell resigned from the Bush administration following his re-election in November 2004. Powell's reputation damaged, but not destroyed. He later rose above politics to endorse the campaign of Barack Obama in 2008, again boosting a candidate lacking foreign policy experience. Like many in the Bush orbit, Colin Powell opposed Donald Trump's two presidential campaigns, instead supporting Democrats Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, who had worked with Powell since the 1980s. Colin Powell is not only a dear friend and a patriot, 
one of our great military leaders and a man of overwhelming decency. General Colin Powell left the Republican Party earlier this year to become an independent. His legacy won of outstanding service and historic firsts, but his advice was sometimes not heeded and his political potential ultimately unexplored. Well, you covered plenty there, John. I just want to add a couple of things. I think people often skip past the 1980s with Colin Powell, but this is a period when Powell led the recovery from Vietnam and was said to restore training and discipline to the army. It was also when he developed the so-called Powell Doctrine that you referred to before. It was during this period that he decided he would help prevent another Vietnam by, quote, not acquiescing in half-hearted warfare for half-baked reasons that the American people could not understand. Bit ironic given what was to come. Mm. On that, I think Powell greatly regretted the role he played in getting America into Iraq, but not just the UN speech. Also the fact that the authorization to wage war in Iraq was billed as an attempt to give the weapons inspectors that Powell advocated for the heft that they needed to keep the peace. Powell once talked about his UN speech to the AARP and he said that when people ask me, is this a blot on your record? Yeah, okay, fine. It's a blot on my record. It's there for everybody to see forever. There's one other negative about Powell that I think we should acknowledge, and that is he was the father of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Bill Clinton wanted to let homosexuals serve openly in the military. Powell did not. And Don't Ask, Don't Tell was their messy compromise. It's a great example, I think, of when pragmatism doesn't necessarily create the optimum result. Finally, I just want to share what I think was the highest point of Powell's support for Obama that John mentioned earlier. When he went further than even Democrats were prepared to go at the time. I'm also troubled by not what Senator McCain says, but what members of the party say. And it is permitted to be said such things as, well, you know that Mr. Obama is a Muslim. Well, the correct answer is he is not a Muslim. He's a Christian. He's always been a Christian. But the really right answer is, what if he is? Is there something wrong with being a Muslim in this country? The answer is no, that's not America. Is there something wrong with some seven-year-old Muslim American kid believing that he or she could be president? Yet I have heard senior members of my own party drop this suggestion. He's a Muslim and he might be associated with terrorists. This is not the way we should be doing it in America. What's wrong if he is a Muslim? There's nothing wrong with that. We didn't hear enough of that in 2008. No, certainly a moment of real moral clarity. Mm -hmm. And for more, we're joined by Dr Richard Haas, a longtime friend and senior advisor to General Colin Powell. These days, he's president of the Influential Council on Foreign Relations. Dr Haas, welcome back to Planet America. Glad to be with you. A lot has been said and written about General Colin Powell this week. Knowing him as you do, what are you thinking of this week? Well, for me, he was first and foremost a close friend for more than four decades. He was a colleague. We worked together uh, in several incarnations at the Pentagon, at the State Department, when I was at the White House. Uh, he was also my boss in my last job. He was Secretary of State. I was uh, Director of Policy Planning. So he's somebody... Uh, who I had a whole set of uh, relationships with. And like, I think almost everybody else who came into contact with him, I'll think of him as an extraordinary individual, just a, a man of uh, first-class temperament, uh, intellectually just a straight, uh, a straight shooter, open-minded, decent, and a, a real believer in people. Uh, it was interesting, when, whether he was commanding troops in the army or when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or when he was Secretary of State, he really thought of the people who worked for him as, as his troops, and he felt a tremendous obligation to make sure that, that they were well. And I'm wondering, Richard Haas, we've heard about how close Colin Powell came to running for president in 1996. If he had, in that counterfactual, he could have potentially been president on 9-11. So I wonder, how do you think his handling of 9-11 and the aftermath of it could have been different to President Bush? Again, it's, it's a counterfactual that's piled pretty high. My own view is there was consensus within the government after 9-11 that the Taliban had to be removed once they would not agree to give up the terrorists who were responsible for the deaths of 3,000 people in a, in a single day. And that was important also, not simply so they couldn't carry out additional attacks, but to establish the norm in international relations that we would not distinguish between terrorists and those who gave them support or, or sanctuary. So I believe any American president would have acted to oust the, the, the Taliban from power. 
After that, though, that I can't sit here and tell you what he would have done. Would you have had the buildup in Afghanistan, uh, given what Colin Powell has written about the use of military force? I think not. He was he was skeptical of using military forces in ways that he believes they were not designed to do. He thought militaries were very good at destroying things, uh, at attacking things. He was less confident of the ability of militaries to get involved in these other messier situations. So my, my, my guess is, for what it's worth, is that he would have had second and third thoughts about the, the kind of buildup in Afghanistan even more. Would he have gone to Iraq? No. He would have pursued other uh, policies. He was interested in those other policies when he was Secretary of State. But at the end of the day, he was the odd man out in the cabinet, the president and everybody else around them, the vice president, the national security advisor, the secretary of defense and others. They all wanted to go to war against Iraq. Colin Powell did not. But again, he was the odd man out. I'm wondering, Richard Haas, uh, to what extent do you think Colin Powell felt that his his stature, his integrity were being exploited or abused by the Bush administration when they pushed him out there in front of the United Nations, in front of the cameras to make the case for war in Iraq? Look, he had no illusion about why he was asked to give that statement. Uh, he had, in some ways, more prestige, certainly internationally, than anybody else in the administration. The fact that he was known not to be wildly enthusiastic, to say the least, about the war in some ways added to it, which is exactly why it was useful to the administration. So he knew that, but he was also a professional. And anytime you work for a president, anytime you work for administration, you're often asked to do things that you don't necessarily agree with. It's not grounds for resigning uh, unless it's such a high matter of principle. And in this case, we, he and the rest of us were operating under the assumption that Saddam Hussein did indeed possess weapons of mass destruction. Even knowing that Powell's preference was that the United States not go to war. He thought there was more we could do with sanctions and other tools. He didn't think Saddam Hussein, even with a small amount of weapons of mass destruction, was a vital threat to the United States. But the idea of going to war, if he did have weapons of mass destruction, again, as was thought, was not a preposterous idea. It just wasn't his or, for that matter, my preferred idea. And so Powell was comfortable being out there giving this speech, and he went to extraordinary lengths to, to make sure, to the extent he could, that everything he said was factually accurate. He, got, he basically deleted most of the material he was asked to say, came up with a new script, one blessed word by word by the intelligence community. So when he appeared before the world at the UN in early 2003, he believed that what he was saying was 100% accurate. Uh, so there was no intent to, to mislead. There was an intent to explain why it was the United States had come to the conclusion that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction and why it had, it had decided that was an unacceptable situation. Dr. Haas, do you think it's unfair how much of Colin Powell's legacy has been tied up with that one speech he made to the UN about Iraq's weapons in 2003? Absolutely. This is a man who, if you look at his career, he was the first African-American national security advisor, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of State. He helped rebuild the American army after the debacle of Vietnam. And the American army in some ways is what has become one of the great institutions, professional, diverse in the, uh, in the United States. He steadied the National Security Council in the Reagan administration after the problems of Iran-Contra and other uh, scandals. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time of the, the Gulf War that ousted Saddam Hussein from, from Kuwait, this extraordinary international coalition. And by the way, Powell was one of those people who argued, it, quote unquote, against going to Baghdad. Uh, he understood the importance of using military force with, with discipline. And in the case of the Iraq war, again, uh, he was not an advocate of it. And when he gave that speech, that statement, everything he said he thought was accurate. And by the way, George W. Bush was prepared to go to war without the international commuting community supporting it. So the idea that Colin Powell was somehow central to the United States going to war in, against Iraq in 2003 is simply inconsistent with the truth. And again, I don't think any person should be judged by one episode in a career that has dozens of, of demonstrations of, of, of tremendous success. And again, even in this case, the fact that he was wrong 
did not in any way reflect uh, intent. We were all wrong. It's, a, it's what's called confirmation bias. The entire U.S. government uh, was acting under the presumption that Saddam Hussein had weapons uh, of mass destruction. So there's no reason that Colin Powell should be singled out any more than, than literally dozens or if not hundreds or thousands of other American officials. Finally, Dr. Haas, you were a close friend of Colin Powell. So what's a memory that you might have or some fact that we might not have any idea about that you know that you could share about Colin Powell? Oh, I don't know. Uh, the way he used to relax, for some of us, it's, it's golf. For some of us, it's tennis. For him, it was uh, fixing Volvos. And I think he liked the idea of having a car and hundreds of pieces on the ground and putting it together. It was something he could quietly do and uh, accomplish. Let me tell you one story at work one day when he was Secretary of State. We had the large staff meeting, and a lot of it was about the, a security problem at an American embassy abroad. Clearly, the people on the ground had, shall we say, made some mistakes. But Powell was surprisingly calm and didn't jump down anybody's uh, back. Everybody le left the room. He asked me to stay behind. And we talked about it. And I said, I got a question for you, Colin. Why is it uh, you were so low-keyed there? Clearly, uh, people had really uh, messed up. And he said, Richard, one of the things I learned in the Army is that first reports are never complete and they're never accurate. So there'll be time to hold people accountable later, but you don't want to do that until you make sure you understand the entire situation, that you've got it right and you've got it complete. And that for me was a real lesson. It was someone who had obviously commanded uh, people before. It was someone who had been in all sorts of crises. And it was a sense of basically hold your fire, stay calm, make sure you've got it right, and then you can do what, what needs doing. And Powell wasn't shy about doing what needs doing. But the idea that you, you wouldn't fly off the handle until you were confident you had all your facts and you had things sorted out, that to me was someone who was comfortable with command. Dr. Haas, we really appreciate your reflections on Colin Powell this week. Thanks for being with us on Planet America. Thank you all. After weeks where President Biden seemed pretty content to let congressional Democrats try and hammer out the size and scope of that social spending bill, largely without his direct input this week, he made it his top priority. Today, he is spending virtually nearly every minute of his day meeting with members of Congress, and I think that's a reflection of how uh, urgent he feels moving things forward. And in the process, the likely price tag has been winnowed down from that ballpark $3.5 trillion to something less than two. According to the Washington Post, Biden told those members of Congress he met with this week he wants universal pre-kindergarten care rather than free community college tuition to make the final cut. And President Biden is looking at other ways to get to where the likes of Bernie Sanders want to go. Instead of adding vision and dental to Medicare, Biden has now floated the idea of giving seniors a debit card loaded with $800 to spend on dental benefits. President Biden also reportedly told Democrats this week that he wants a deal on the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the go-it-alone Democrat social spending bill by the end of October, when he is due to depart on a trip to Europe. Politico reporting that while subsidies for Obamacare health insurance and Medicaid expansion for low-income Americans remain on the table, cost-cutting will see that money provided for shorter periods. Instead of making the child tax credit expansion permanent as planned, it is now likely to be extended for just one more year creating an issue for next year's midterms, not coincidentally. And it looks like moderate Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia has kept his coal industry buddies in that state sweet by blackballing a proposed clean electricity performance program, which would pay utilities to increase their use of renewables. Politico says that is a, quote, likely drop. And according to friend of the show, progressive Congressman Ro Canna, at this point, failure is just not an option for Democrats. Everyone understands the stakes. We have to pass the president's agenda. Democracy is at stake. We have to show that we can govern. So we are getting right down to everybody's bottom line, Chaz. What we don't yet know is if they're ultimately going to get to yes. Well, as far as the clean electricity performance plan goes, they definitely did not get to yes, and that was a massive loss for environmentalists. That program there was responsible for 56% of the total emission reductions from this bill by 2030. So the loss of that is going to hurt progressives.
badly. And the concessions don't end there. Biden's signature policy has been the expansion of the child tax credit to help out all parents. Manchin has also insisted that the child tax credit must include a work requirement and also a family income of no more than $60,000. He wants to put a cap there, which would instantly make it much less targeted towards the very poor, as well as missing a bunch of struggling middle class types. Remember, only earlier this year, Mitt Romney put out a child tax credit proposal that had an income cap of $200,000 per person or $400,000 per family, seven times Manchin's limit, and Romney's plan had no work requirements. So Manchin is significantly to the right of Mitt Romney with this response. Meanwhile, Manchin's partner in crime, Kirsten Sinema, has reiterated that she simply will not vote for any reconciliation bill until Congress has first approved the trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Wonderful, we need more of that argument. Also, Cinema's push to oppose allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices down has received some assistance from a dark money ad buy. Want to continue with this medication? I'm sorry, they just said no. Who said no? Insurance companies and Washington bureaucrats. These guys are working together to swipe $500 billion from Medicare to pay for Pelosi and Schumer's out of control spending spree. They're calling it Medicare negotiation, but really it's just a way to cut your benefits and no longer pay for life-saving medicines. Well, that doesn't even vaguely reflect reality, but as you can see, that policy has been dragged through the mud. Mind you, there is plenty of mud to go around. Left-wing polling outfit Data for Progress has found that 70% of potential 2024 Arizona Democratic primary voters have a negative view of Kirsten Cinema. So no one is getting away from this argument clean. The main problem is this. After a large rise during the pandemic and people demanding the government do more to solve their problems, that is the purple line you see there, this year there's been a massive reversal. The government is on the nose again. But if we look at the polling for this bill, even though there are some very popular policies in there, only 10% of people say they know a lot of specific things about what's in this bill. And the majority say they know no specifics. And it turns out that some very popular programs are amongst the least well-known programs in this package. But what they do know about are two things. The three and a half trillion dollar figure and that the bill will have tax hikes. So that is obviously gonna make the bill less appealing to the newly resurgent, the government should get out of my way crowd. That's a pretty big problem, John. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I mention that essential vote Joe Manchin is going around telling reporters that he doesn't see much chance of the bill being finished by the October 31 deadline? Because that's a problem too. Yeah, and the problems don't end there with Joe. Uh, another one being reported as a threat by Manchin to quit the Democratic Party altogether. Uh, it came after a heated meeting <laughs> with Independent Senator Bernie Sanders this week. David Corn got the scooplet for Mother Jones, reporting that Manchin is considering leaving unless that social spending bill is cut to 1.75 trillion. Otherwise, I'm quitting the party. Problem. Yeah, that's hardball. <laughs> now, Australian WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is fighting against extradition to the United States, where he potentially faces an 18-count indictment accusing him of conspiring to hack into US military databases. If convicted, Assange could face a sentence of up to 175 years in jail, although US government lawyers have indicated that he would likely be jailed for between six and eight years. Still not nothing. Last January, a UK court ruled against Assange being extradited, in part because of the judge's concerns that Assange's mental health was so precarious, he was at a high risk of committing suicide in custody. So Assange remains on remand in Britain's Belmarsh prison. The US government appealed that early decision. Next week is when that appeal is being heard. But Chaz, since that last hearing, some truly astonishing reports have come to light suggesting that the United States was hatching a plan at pretty high levels to either kidnap or possibly even kill Julian Assange 
while he was still holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. You nailed the word there, astonishing. Mm. Yahoo has published a piece that suggests that the CIA boss back then, Mike Pompeo, was willing to consider pretty much any course of action to get rid of Julian Assange, including staged car accidents and even Bond movie-style street shootouts. Yahoo says that discussions over kidnapping or even killing Assange occurred at the highest levels of the Trump administration and the CIA. One former senior counterintelligence official said there seemed to be no boundaries. And this is a serious report. It was based on conversations with more than 30 former US officials, eight of whom described details of the CIA's plan to abduct Assange. So that sounds pretty solid to me. The discussions about potentially killing Assange, they seem a bit more pie in the sky, I reckon, but they apparently occurred amongst some senior CIA figures at one point in time. Now, note, the report does not accuse Trump of having anything to do with this. In fact, Trump's the only one who seems to have denied the report. But the report implies very heavily that this was Pompeo's fixation, which leads us to the worst bit. You might be wondering how any of this is legal without first of informing at least the president, probably Congress. Well, remember this peculiar speech? It's time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. Non-state hostile intelligence service. That's a weird turn of phrase. Mm. It turns out that when American intelligence wants to secretly interfere with a target, the president is supposed to authorise it first, and it must also be briefed to the House and Senate intelligence committees, like we thought, unless those actions are taken against another spy agency then they don't have to inform anyone. So that little excerpt then I just played was Pompeo's way of formally declaring WikiLeaks a spy service so then they could be legally far more aggressive with WikiLeaks than they normally would be allowed to. Now, I know that the CIA never actually acted on their more lurid plans. That's important to mm. note. But if it's true that that weird sentence we heard before was what justified the CIA turning into the Bourne identity, then there needs to be some new laws passed to make sure that never happens again, because that is downright scary. And I'd be surprised if it didn't cast a long shadow over America's attempt to extradite Assange this weekend. Yeah, and possibly over Mike Pompeo's burgeoning presidential bid in yeah. 2024 as well. Joining us now is Icelandic investigative journalist and editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, Christian Harrison. Christian, welcome back to Planet America. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So what can you tell us right now about Julian Assange's physical and, importantly, his mental health heading into next week's extradition appeal? Has he been independently assessed recently? Uh, no, not uh, not by a doctor, but uh, he's in a relatively stable condition. Uh, but, of course, uh, this is wearing down. He has now been uh, a remand prisoner, which is, of course, outrageous for more than two years uh, since... Uh, September 20th, uh, 2019. Uh, that, this is totally outrageous. Usually, usually uh, uh, that is way above maximum uh, of, of uh, remand uh, imprisonment. Uh, but uh, he is, of course, hopeful that he will get justice in the uh, uh, appeal hearing and uh, he will soon see the end of this. So seeing as Julian's mental state is such a critical part of the legal case, do you have any sense of whether it's better or worse than it was nine months ago during the original extradition trial? I haven't been able to uh, uh, see him and I have uh, only spoken to him uh, over, a phone, over the phone uh, a few times. Uh, I don't see it has improved. I think we are seeing the same um, elements in place there. And Christian, we've been hearing these reports about this extraordinary alleged CIA plot to either kidnap or assassinate Julian Assange while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in 2017. Do you know anything about that other than these reports? And do you know to what extent will these play into the legal case next week? I cannot say it was a surprise because we have had uh, indication that uh, uh, very spurious things were going on, even uh, on a, a plan to kidnap him. This came from the, the highest authority. This was laid out, the plan, by uh, Mike Pompeo, who was then director of CIA, uh, and uh, it was discussed in the White House, according 
uh, to the story and uh, uh, Yahoo News sources. The assassination plot was also on the table, and uh, that is shocking to see that people were contemplating on the highest level uh, to uh, uh, take Julian Assange's life. Now, of course, this will have a direct uh, bearing on the appeal case. The United States, of course, is appealing the decision in the magistrate court uh, in January that Julian should not be extradited. The agency that can request and often requests full uh, solitary confinement, uh, so-called special administrative measures, is precisely the CIA. Uh, which would put Julian in a pre-trial condition under total isolation and even after he is sentenced. So we are now seeing after these revelations that uh, his fate will be in the hands of the agency who only a few years ago were planning to kidnap or assassinate him. Now, Kristen, that same Yahoo report said that the CIA had plans for, quote, extensive spying on WikiLeaks associates, sowing discord amongst the group's members and stealing their electronic devices. At WikiLeaks, have you seen any evidence of that kind of activity? It is quite obvious that we knew that uh, when, in 2017, uh, Mike Pompeo, director of the CIA, in his first public appearance, first public speech, uh, talked almost exclusively about uh, WikiLeaks and the danger of WikiLeaks and very carefully chose his words as designating WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence service. Now, nobody had heard that uh, 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 before, uh, never been used before. This was tailored for WikiLeaks, uh, but the words speak for themselves. It meant that uh, uh, or the gloves were off, uh, anything was uh, on the table, and uh, they felt by this designation that they would have every right to use uh, aggressive methods in, uh, in dealing with not just Julian, but uh, WikiLeaks staff, in the same manner as, that, uh, as they would to be dealing with uh, uh, foreign spies. Kristen, has that report changed the way do you guys at WikiLeaks take precautions now or the way you might deal with stories coming from America? Not really. I mean, this is basically a situation that we've had to live with for uh, 10 years. It has been a, a constant uh, uh, threat. Uh, not a, we have, well, of course, we did not know the, uh, the length of, of uh, and the extent of the measures that were being planned against us, but we took uh, very uh, uh, good precautions. And uh, for year after years, years on, and, and, and the, uh, the, uh, we were being called uh, extremely paranoid. Uh, Julian was being called uh, disillusioned because uh, uh, he talked about these threats. He talked about the the threat of, of the extradition to, to the United States so that would that would be imminent. And, uh, but of course, uh, we were and he was right the entire time. This was always looming and, and now it's, uh, it's materializing and uh, information is coming forth from, from how far people are willing to go. And Christian Harrison, what would your message be today for people watching that think, I've been hearing about Julian Assange for 10 years, I'm kind of over him, didn't like what he did to get Trump elected in 2016. Why should I even care about this guy at this point? Well, they should, they should care about Julian Assange because of those principles that are at stake. Uh, the, the case against Julian is the first attack of this nature against a publisher in the world by the, the Western Empire, it will not stop there if it goes forward. Uh, other journalists will be uh, subject of uh, a similar uh, measures if this is not caused. So it's an attack on journalism and it's uh, acknowledged by all journalistic unions, uh, the International Federation of Journalists and uh, the Australian uh, uh, charter of, of uh, that association as well. So people should care about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that uh, 
is uh, the core of this case. Uh, what they may think uh, about Julia Assange, based on faulty reporting, on smears or whatever, is beside the point. Uh, it is the principle at stake here. And it's a very big principle that has to be governed. If the appeal for the extradition is denied to America, but not for legal reasons, but because Julian is seen to be a suicide risk, would you consider that a victory? Or would you consider that to be just as much a threat for the future? Well, it is a partial victory if uh, they, uh, the High Court in London decides to uh, uh, uphold the decision of the Magistrate Court and denies the extradition. And of course, uh, I would be very happy finally to see Julian Assange walking free out of this horrible prison where he has been now for two and a half years. But uh, it's only a partial victory and the fight will continue uh, because of the principles that I mentioned. Uh, the attack against Julian Assange uh, in this manner is an attack on, on freedom of the press. And uh, we cannot uh, allow that to happen. Christian Harrison, good to talk to you again. Thanks for being with us on Planet America. Thanks for having me. The US House of Representatives voted earlier today to hold former Trump presidential advisor Steve Bannon in criminal contempt for defying a subpoena to appear before the committee investigating the January 6th attack on the US Capitol building. Bannon has refused to appear until a claim of executive privilege is heard. Just nine Republicans joined the Democratic majority in voting to hold Bannon in contempt. The matter is now being referred to the US Justice Department, which will determine whether to mount a prosecution or not. Contempt of Congress is an unusual and historically rather slow-moving process. When alleged communists working in Hollywood refused to testify before the infamous House Un-American Activities Committee in 1947, it took about three years for any of them to end up in federal prison. So we'll see what happened this time, Chaz. Look, I don't want to prejudge, but it's very difficult to see how someone who wasn't working for Trump at the time mm. could claim his communications with Trump fall under executive privilege. What, however, is very easy to see is if Bannon can just stay in court for 14 months, then Congress may change hands and the January 6th committee will then be disbanded and he won't need to worry about it. Very easy to see that. And that is why your three-year court process for contempt that you just described before is extremely relevant. The question now is, will the Department of Justice opt to take the House's recommendation and prosecute Bannon? This won't help. <laughs> congressional subpoenas on the January 6th committee. I hope that the committee goes after them and uh, holds them accountable. Should they similar. be prosecuted by the I, Justice I do, Department? yes. See now, that not only contradicts Biden's promise during the election campaign to keep out of the DOJ, but it places them in a position of either being Biden's henchmen or undermining him completely with whatever decision they make. For the record, a DOJ spokesperson did immediately put out a statement saying the Department of Justice will make its own independent decisions in all prosecutions based solely on the facts of the law, period, full stop. Really so. though? Yeah. <laughs> Finally tonight. That's a bunch of malarkey. And here is the kind of thing that some Americans are still hearing and seeing about the COVID vaccine. It's an egg that hatches into a synthetic parasite and grows inside your body. This is like a sci-fi nightmare. And it's happening in front of us. I'd suggest it's a little more five than size. I'd suggest you're right. And you will be <laughs> relieved to hear that that is actually not true. But sadly, people like Rick Wiley, who is an end-of-times conspiracy theorist, still gets plenty of airtime on platforms like truenews.com. <laughs> Free speech is a wonderful thing, of course, but we know there are constitutional limits in the United States. The Supreme Court acknowledges that. You cannot yell fire in a crowded theatre and cause a panic when there is no fire. Surely this COVID misinformation is the equivalent of that. It is certainly... Malaki. Now, is the TRU news thing <laughs> one of those ones where you can't, they don't put an E there because they don't want to spell true so they don't get sued? Yeah, they've got smart lawyers. But that's <laughs> it for another trip to Planet America. We will be back at the same time next week. We don't have many shows left for 2021, so hit me up on Twitter if there's a particular guest you'd like us to chase after. We'll see what we can do. Nicki Minaj. <laughs> uh, and you'll find us on ABC, iView, YouTube and Facebook. 
Plus, there is a new pet podcast for the peppers right there. See ya.